my name is Catherine LaRue. I'm the Executive Director of Business Development at Algonquin College. Uh, we have been hosting the Future of Work series since last December. Um, and in December, January, and February, we did these sessions face-to-face, -face, but obviously, like the rest of you, um, we were required in March to pivot to virtual, and we've actually found that there are some benefits to delivering this type of programming virtually. So future of work is really about change, I think, as everyone knows. Uh, keeping up with change requires innovation, an entrepreneurial mindset, it demands a willingness to do things differently. And I haven't spoken to a single person in the last 11 months who hasn't learned how to do things differently. So um, the Future of Work Speaker Series is really designed to help us do that as leaders in our organizations. And, uh, and especially in this shifting landscape, which shifts just about every day as Rod and I were talking about a little bit earlier uh, before we got the call started. So I have the, the privilege of introducing our wonderful group of presenters and speakers today. And um, I'm gonna start off with Rod Morgan from the RPM Academy. Uh, we've done a lot of work with Rod at Algonquin College. He's uh, one of Canada's foremost Lean Six Sigma trainers and practitioners. He's a founding member of eSigma Canada uh, for over 10 years, uh, up until 2017. He served as the chief instructor for the master's certificate in Lean Six Sigma Healthcare at the Schulich School of Business. Um, very long pedigree, Rod. I'm not going to go through every single bit of it, but I think hit the highlights. Uh, Rod is president of Sigma Plus Solutions. He's managed hundreds of successful improvement initiatives and Lean CI cultural transformations in all sorts of industries and organizations. And over the last 10 years, a lot of his work has centered on supporting a variety of organizations through the changes that we're all having to go through. So um, a very great pedigree and we're very pleased. We're, we've been thrilled to work with Rod over the years and continue to work with him. So thank you for being here, Rod. Um, our second presenter is Dr. Ahmed Tamori. He's a professor of supply chain management at Algonquin. Um, again, an incredible, incredible um, pedigree with uh, Dr. Tamori. He received his PhD from Telfer School of Management from the University of Ottawa U, um, University of Ottawa. He has a Master of Applied Science degree in project management. He has an MBA from the University of Tehran and a Master of Management Information Technology and an undergraduate degree in industrial engineering. Um, he's taught operation management, supply chain management, project management, business stats, and Lean Six Sigma throughout uh, for our college and, and other areas. And he's done incredibly in-depth research that's been widely published, focused on mathematical modeling in the field of revenue and supply chain management and big data analy analysis. And it, not only that, he's also got over 15 years of work experience in car manufacturing, oil and gas projects, postal service supply chain, and others. So welcome, Dr. Tamori. And we also have two additional people joining us today to actually talk about the practical applications of what Rod and, and Dr. Tamori are going to talk about. Our guests are from uh, Briere Continuing Care, wonderful, wonderful organization in our city. Um, uh, I have had the ple well, pleasure, I guess. My mother uh, went to Elizabeth Briere into palliative care where she received some of the most outstanding care that, that we could ever have imagined. Um, and today joining us from Breer, we have uh, Isabel Bosse and Chris Sorfleet, and they're going to discuss their experiences with implementing lean in their facilities. So we have a very, very packed agenda today. Um, I would ask everyone uh, if they have questions to put them in the chat. We will not address them as each speaker is uh, speaking, but we will circle back to them. And there will be a Q&A at the end as well if there are additional questions. And um, all of this is available through our website. So uh, without further ado, um, Rod, I think I'm handing it over to you first, I believe. Yep, oh, you're on mute. There we go. There we go. Thank you, you think you'd uh, get over that hurdle. Uh, thank you so much for the very kind introduction. I'm, I'm more interested in hearing from Dr. Uh, Professor Tamore and, and also from Isabel and Chris at Breer, but um, I have the privilege of, of kind of giving a quick introduction to Lean. And normally I, I just, it comes off the top of my head, like uh, uh, Professor Tamori, I've been involved in this for such a long time, but I did make a few notes just so I, I wouldn't miss anything. 
you know, when I think about lean and, and having been involved in it for now, I guess, decades, what a scary thought that is. Um, there are, first thing that comes to mind are words, you know, the words that you would associate with lean. Uh, one is about creating capacity that can be reinvested into the customers and clients an organization exists to serve. Um, I remember uh, with a, a client once in healthcare, healthcare being very, very much involved in continuous improvement, probably going back, uh, if not to the beginning of healthcare, centuries, uh, a, a dynamic changing field uh, where incredible demands are being placed on them routinely and even more so now. Uh, a director at a regional health authority once shared with her team, lean is, is, is going to help us free up capacity that can be reinvested in the community. And, and I, I kind of like that approach. Um, lean is also about respectfully challenging the paradigms that govern as well as influence how an organization operates from the executive offices and boardrooms to the frontline operations. And it's about enabling all members of an organization to view the work that they're doing with a, a new perspective, a new set of eyes, starting with fundamental definitions of what is value. So in that sense, lean is, is really about changing a culture, uh, but I believe it does go beyond the workplace. Lean thinking can be applied at a very personal level with tools and methods that can be employed at home and not just limited to places of employment. When you first get introduced to lean, one of the first concepts, uh, paradigm shifts, probably the most important, a little bit like navigating through a forest with a compass, you need that north. You need, in, in fact, not a north that you see, but a north that everyone else sees in the organization, regardless of their role. It's a statement that says, what is it that we consider to be a value that is stated from the perspective of the customer? What does the customer see as being value? In the manufacturing world, it, uh, there's a, a short statement that says, lean thinking, any process step activity or task that transforms the deliverable of a process such that the customer is aware of you doing it and is willing to pay you to do it would be considered a value. Anything else would be considered non-value added. Now, of course, that language needs to be adapted without it being distilled or, or creating any ambiguity. There, there should be a, a black and white definite, a difference between what is value versus non-value added. In healthcare, for instance, it could be any activity or task that moves the patient through education, awareness, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment is done right the first time and the customer and or community is willing to pay or fund that activity. That would be considered a value. So it, it's a very harsh assessment, uh, but when you apply that to looking at work and resources that are being consumed, including time, you see that a lot of things fall into the category of non-value added that the actual pure value that's being created is a much smaller portion of the overall resource consumption, including time. So defining value is a starting position and it's one of the first five principles of lean. After that, it's really understanding your business, your organization, what you do, understanding mapping and documenting your value streams, which are comprised of all of the tasks and activities and processes and procedures, resource utilization, equipment, everything, even the waste generation. Um, and identifying out of all of that, what is it truly that's contributing to value? Let's hold up our compass and look at that. And once you've done that, then you can start looking at, well, what doesn't fit our pure definition of value? And that becomes non-value added or waste. Now, once we've identified and cataloged that waste, we just find ways to remove it from the value streams in a very systematic way, in a way that we're not simply moving the waste downstream. The, for that, for, for, at that point, I think it's really about inspiration and perspiration, a lot of heavy lifting, a lot of, a lot of movement to get things to happen. But as we I systematically remove that waste, we start to improve flow. We start to free up capacity. We can be more nimble. We can be more responsible. And no, no, no more important sector in today's world than that of healthcare. So kudos to Breuer and other healthcare organizations that are continually trying to find ways to embrace, adapt, and, and adopt lean in ways that help them in terms of their organizational goals. 
But as, as we eliminate that waste, we can become more nimble. And what we want is that we want to be able to be in a position to be so nimble that the client, the customer can pull what they need when they need it. We try to avoid batching. We try to improve the flow, access to information, access to resources just in time when the customer needs it. So Lean, Lean kind of offers a, a universal truth when it comes to all forms of work, but it might even apply to the entire human experience. Our relentless pursuit of what we consider to be a value. One size, however, does not fit all. And I'm sure that Briere is going to share with you their perspectives on this. Is Like clothes in a department store, Lean principal tools and methods really need to be adapted to best serve an organization or industry sector. Even the tailoring of the language, what terms you use, needs to be chosen very carefully to provide the best fit. To be honest, lean thinking principles, tools, and methods can be summarized on one sheet of paper. Lean is very simple to understand. It's extremely difficult to do, do well, as well as sustain. The majority exposed to lean will often remark, well, that, what you've shared with me is common sense. And, and they really wouldn't be that far off the mark in, in saying that. Lean is about common sense, but requires, as I mentioned per, previously, looking at things differently with a different set of eyes. In some cases, age old paradigms need to be respectfully abandoned for new thinking. With this type of change, respect has to be first and foremost. Respect for the institutions, respect for the leadership, and most importantly, respect for other people working in those institutions. The human resources that are engaged in any number of functions, all contributing to their own way uh, of, of providing outcomes that the organization serves to produce, be it services or products. You know, COVID-19, you, you can't get away from the conversations about COVID-19, we're immersed in it, unfortunately. Um, and that is change, change on a massive global scale. What we have learned and what we continue to learn as we all navigate this incredibly difficult and often all too often sad, tragic episode is really about change. Change can come in the form of evolution. Change can come as a result of planning, intentional change. And then of course, we have change foisted upon us and COVID-19 is one of, those, uh, one of those things, unfortunately. It's a fluid situation, it's evolving. And, and we're being forced to challenge paradigms. How we work, remote working being one example, how we engage with people is affecting us at a very personal level, but also professionally, at an organizational level, at an industry sector level, community as well as societal. We're adapting and designing for this current new norm. And the thing is that we also need to start thinking about the future and designing for that future. My hope is that lean will play a role in what that design looks like. I think the greatest tragedy we have ahead of us is avoiding and not leveraging the lessons that we're learning, that we can continue to learn and, and create perhaps a, a better, brighter future out of all of this tragedy and maybe out of it, I might be bold enough to say is a, a better world. Lean is not a panacea for all the challenges that an individual or an organization or even a society faces, but it can play a very, very important role in terms of a game changer, in terms of paradigm shifts, how we define value has to be carefully thought out and adapted again for the organization, the community and the sector that we're hoping to be able to serve with some sort of lean uh, meal, if you will, the principles, tools and methods. So I, I really am very fortunate to be a part of this esteemed panel. I, uh, I'm very interested to learn more from Professor Tamori and, and especially with Burier and all of the great work that they're doing. And, Having said that, I, I think I've talked enough about lean and the rest is back to you and the, the panelists. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks, Rod, that was great. And, and Rod always has such wonderful analogies. When you started talking about moving waste downstream, that wasn't a pretty picture that it gave me, but I get the message. And, uh, and just the idea of a lean meal, very, very interesting. So yeah, now we're gonna hear from uh, our group from uh, Briere Continuing Care and uh, both Isabel and Christopher have kindly given us their time today to help us uh, understand any of the challenges or any of the lessons learned as they applied lean to, uh, to the Briere group. So over to you two. 
Perfect. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Chris Sorfleet. I'm the Director of Quality, Patient Safety and Risk Management for Briere. Uh, and I'll just give a, a quick overview of what Briere is. Um, it's a multi-site academic healthcare organization uh, with over 600 hospital beds uh, in the region uh, and close to 500 residential beds. So that includes some long-term care uh, and some residential programs. Uh, we have about 2,500 staff and physicians uh, across those sites. And uh, we're definitely uh, involved in that COVID response piece. Um, so a little bit of background. In 2004, uh, we relaunched a quality framework. Uh, Rod had mentioned uh, that healthcare has been involved in quality improvement for quite some time. Uh, and this was our effort to reformalize the commitment and have some structures in place to allow for teams at the front line to be able to drive improvement at the unit level. Um, and that's really all focused on uh, patient experience and patient outcomes. Um, as part of the framework launch, uh, we had quality teams implemented at the unit level, um, some overarching uh, quality structures, um, and we provided some initial training in quality improvement methodology. Uh, that was a great start, uh, but we found there was uh, a need for some, uh, some more tools uh, for the teams to be able to use to make those improvements. And one of the tool sets that we identified uh, was Lean. Uh, so in 2015, uh, we began offering uh, Lean training to uh, staff, physicians, and leaders across the organization. Uh, and really the goal was to equip them with the tools that they could use to make improvements across the system. Uh, we continued with additional cohorts in 2016, 17, 18, and over 70 formal and informal uh, leaders uh, went through training and uh, received a green belt in lean. Um, I'll pass it over to Isabel, who was kind of the instrumental piece in, in operationalizing that. Thank you, Chris. Um, Isabel Boisset here. Um, I'm the director of the learning and development team at Briere. I've been at Briere for a little over eight years now. It's uh, funny how time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> uh, so I was part of um, the implementation of Lean at Briere. And as Chris mentioned, we did uh, reach out to a number of formal and informal leaders and offered that training. Um, at the time, uh, it was a five-day training program spanning over a three-month period. And we were really uh, trying to get the clinical managers, the supervisors, the informal leaders uh, to attend so that they could uh, use these tools and that methodology with their own teams when they were going back to their units. So offered a number of cohorts like 2015, 2016, 17, and 18. And the I think that what was the greatest um, feature of the lean training and where it really, really made a big difference for Briere is that at first we were just asking for registration. So people were registering for the program. We would keep it to a small group. Uh, so it was easier um, in terms of facilitation, time with the instructor and all that. It worked really well. But at one point we decided, you know what? We'll add a layer to our registration program and process. And we will just ask people to come up with a project idea. Like what would they like to change? So this notion of applied project uh, was added in as part of the registration process. And we sort of tagged on or called on our senior team to choose the projects that best aligned with our strategic orientations. So I think that from adding this one step, we um, got a lot more traction, better alignment, and clearly a return our, on our investment because the projects that were put forward and selected were going to contribute to achieving the goals that we had set for ourselves. So it's not it wasn't like there's so much that we can do, so much that can be changed and improved, but we had to be strategic and we brought in the senior team aligned with our uh, goals 
and closed everything off with a nice ceremony at the end where everybody was to present their projects, their accomplishments, um, the waste that got eliminated and the value that got added. And um, so senior team present every time with their immediate supervisors in the room and then communicating, communicating, communicating. But the applied project piece is a, a winner, a key piece. Um, the sharing with the senior team, I would say is also something that we will keep doing for sure. Um, so in terms of implementation, that's pretty much how we rolled it out. So one cohort every year, small numbers, mainly leaders, and really focusing on strategic projects that would get us closer to our goals, uh, the outcomes we were seeking. Um, in terms of challenges, I would have to say, um, when Rod referred earlier to that paradigm shift, we were certainly feeling it and, and the adaptation that you were uh, suggesting in healthcare, it's, it's not a, it's a service oriented uh, sector. It, it's not a manufacturer type. And sometimes it was hard for us to make that mind shift and switch to like widgets to patients and, and tenants. And so, uh, but once we got over that, um, hump we were we were good to go and we're able to really focus on the current state and then imagining the future state by eliminating all that waste and uh, i think that the methodology um, is helpful in the sense that it's tempting to just jump into solution mode but this technology uh, this methodology of of mapping the current state is forcing us to really um, reflect, learn from each other. There's a lot happening at that current state. I know we're always reaching to the changes and the improvements, but lots of uh, team building and better understanding of each other's roles and responsibilities. So that methodology is, is good for that. And then you can move on and start thinking creatively about what can be done to improve. So that, that paradigm shift adaptation, most definitely. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, I think covered a bit of the rollout, some challenges and, um, and great benefits to the applied projects. Maybe the last thing I would mention is that what's always challenging in our sector and in other sectors, I'm sure, it's to find the time. <laughs> so training is one thing, but that applied project is and like you need to dedicate the time. So defining value, but also allocating and committing the time to do this right. So I'll close on that. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel and Christopher. And um, uh, you know the work that you're doing through Briere is we we applaud you. We are grateful to have you in our community, certainly, especially during these times. So thank you for that. Um, and something that you said that really did strike me is, and I think Rod would certainly support this. It's an iterative process. It's not the kind of process where you roll it out, it's one and done. Um, it's a continuous cycle. So um, thank you for sharing that with us. That, that is spectacular. And I would remind everyone, you can put questions in the chat now, or you can hold them till uh, the Q&A session at the end. Thank you so Great. much. Great. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ahmed Tamori, um, who is going to, uh, I'm sure um, uh, Rod has been waiting uh, for this moment, he's uh, certainly he said that was I think that was the only reason he agreed to, to work on the panel with us <laughs> on the, was so that he could get to learn <laughs> from you. you. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Tamori. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me in this uh, wonderful session. And thank you, Rod, Isabel and Chris. I really enjoyed the discussion. I really enjoy I, I really like learned uh, from uh, what what they mentioned. I just quickly uh, I go two or three minutes about what we are going to do regarding the Lean Six Sigma and Lean in Algonquin College courses. And then I will uh, switch uh, to my slide to a couple of slides to show you what research we are doing in this uh, in this course. So uh, regarding the coursing course and training, uh, I, I'm teaching Lean Six Sigma and Six Sigma course. What we do in this course to help a student to have a better understanding about uh, uh, these two methodology and help them to 
apply them in a real case scenario, we uh, have a group project or final project for these two courses, which means that from the beginning of the course, we create a five or six group of a student five or six five or six students in each group and we ask them while we are going forward during the course and they learn they apply whatever they learn as a real six sigma or lean six sigma depends on the course project and they deliver it and they present it at the end so a student they first they uh, create the group and then they try to define a problem and i always amazed about the problem that this the student they recognize many of them they go to tim horton to find what is the problem of for example waiting time after for a drive through some of them they go to hospital to see what's the problem of emergency rooms why they are waiting time some of them they go for the variation problems some of them they go to OC Transpo and I have uh, I would say 100 examples that how much a student they have capacity to learn and use Six Sigma and Lean Six Sigma in different uh, projects. Then I will help them to gather the data because the data gathering is the, the most important part. Most of the time we don't have access to the data set from the regarding the topic. So they decide to gather data with observation. Uh, specifically for the time management, they need to do the stopwatch. So they decide, they divide to five team members and each of them take the responsibility of, for example, two or three days going to the to a specific location, for example, drive through of McDonald's. And they start measuring the time, how long does it take for each car and why there is a lineup and queue up. So they write up all the observations, they bring it to the group and I meet with, it, with all groups separately to, as a discussion and to help them to find the gap or opportunity for the improvement specifically for lean we are looking for non-value added how we can help this organization or this business to remove non-value added to have not only satisfied customer but also better revenue and better performance if i can reduce the lineup so i can serve more customer at the same time i have uh, more revenue regarding uh, regarding the sale. So it's not just one business, we are applying this to, to different business. At the end of the semester, uh, a student, they present the results, which means that we, I always tell them, you need to be able to sell your project to the to business, to the to environment. Why? Because you know whatever you are using is excellent approach, is a knowledge, but you need also to be able to present it and people, they need to understand it. If you are doing ANOVA analysis, no one knows what ANOVA analysis means, specifically the employer. They wanna know what exactly you ex uh, extracted from regression analysis and how you recognize, for example, non-value added. With this short introduction, uh, let me share my screen with you. We, uh, from last year, we started a, for a research project at Algonquin College. And this project, they are funded by government. What we do, we approach to different businesses, depends on um, uh, how welcome they are regarding this research collaboration. And they, uh, they come up with some uh, problems, specifically business problem related to operation management. When I say operation management, supply chain management uh, problems, operation research problems, uh, project management problems, all of them, they come to this category. Then uh, we write a proposal, we submit the proposal to government and government funds this research $25,000. Sometimes the organizations, they put some cash contribution, we can increase. And then we hire a student. We hire a student, we assign a student on this research to work on a real business problem and we help them to apply whatever they learned from the courses and from the knowledge to the real problem. The, the advantage of this approach is, uh, first of all, the student, they can apply their knowledge in, the, uh, in a real business problem. Also, we, we open the opportunity for a student to find a job. Uh, we had a couple of students, they found a co-op or they received job offer after the project. At the same time, they are not doing for free. They are being paid as a research assistant. And also we are um, college, uh, the value for the college is we are working on the publications to improve the knowledge contribution of the publication in Canadian businesses. So we had uh, DICOM, Canada Post, Loblaws, and recently we approached Canada Blood Services. And we are using 
specifically Lean or Lean Six Sigma as one of the tools and technology we are using. For example, for DICOM, you know DICOM is one of the parcel delivery companies. If you buy something from Amazon, DICOM is one of the companies that they may uh, uh, deliver your, your, uh, your parcel. But this is not the only business that they have. They also move bulky materials. The problem that the DICOM provided to us, uh, they said their transportation ne network is, has limited capacity. They don't have 1,000 trucks. They have limited number of trucks. And those trucks, not only they need to move between the different nodes, not only they need to move a bulky material, they call it LTL less than a truckload, but also they need to move parcels. But this material, they have different um, delivery commitment. Usually parcels, they are very sensitive compared to LTL that they are bulky material. So they were thinking, should they have a separate network for this one network for LTL, one network for parcel or no? Is there any way that they, they can merge these two networks together? So inside the truck, they put a part of LTL, a, a part of parcel. However, they need to make sure they eliminate the waste. This is one of the uh, so uh, space management. They need to streamline the process. Also, they need to make sure the delivery standard is protected. Why? Because the customer, I order something from Amazon. I don't care what a DICOM is doing. I just want to receive my parcel as I was promised. So whatever they do, they need to also protect the customer value. Otherwise, it doesn't have any value added. Customer, they don't want to, to pay for anything that doesn't have value added for customer, even if it's, it's beneficial. This is one of the projects we have for a student. They are working on this and we are publishing in the two, one conference and one of the journal papers in Canada. Another project that we have with Canada Post, you are familiar with this, or, uh, with this company. They are delivering leather made and parcel and they, recently they have many competitors. However, Canada Post has one of the largest transportation network in Canada. Therefore, government of Canada asked them, they need to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide be because of the trucks that they have. Then they decided to switch to rail as a green transportation. However, rail is much, much slower than the uh, truck. If they put the parcel on rail, they are putting the delivery standard on jeopardize. Why? Because Toronto is a heart of Canada Post. They, most of the online sellers, they, uh, they send the volume to Toronto and from Toronto, then they, they dispatch it to other plants, Montreal, Vancouver, Halifax, Calgary, Nova Scotia. Now we are helping Canada Post to see how we can use intermodal transportation option. At the same time, use a combination of rail and road, maybe Lean Six Sigma, Lean is going to help us to improve not only the productivity of the network, transportation network, but also to make sure we can guarantee we are reducing that not significantly, but at least they have a target of two or 3%, the uh, capacity for the truck move them to the rail transportation. This is very challenging. We have five students involved in this research. Another project we approach to Loblaws, Specifically Loblaws, because of this COVID-19, this project is very important for Loblaws. We are talking about over 900 locations in Canada. They are offering collect and collect when you buy something online. It's very easy and enjoyable for, for us as a customer when we buy something online, but you have no idea what is happening in the back office when you order something online. They prepare your order ready for you and you go and pick it up. You may think, actually, this is not difficult. It's very straightforward. You are right, but it's very costly for Loblaws. They are paying too much cost for this process to protect customer satisfaction. So whenever you go to pick up, your item should be ready. But maybe the process that they are doing doesn't have any value added and no uh, profit remain for Loblaws. So they are losing business because of this, but they have to do that. Otherwise, uh, they, they may lose the whole customer. They go to Metro, to Walmart, or Food Basic. We are working with Loblaws to, we just started this, uh, this project to improve the efficiency of online shopping, specifically for click and collect, they ask uh, or help. And their focus 
and their expectation for that research is maximizing customer experience and customer satisfaction. This is exactly as Rod uh, correctly mentioned, one of the main objective or concern of the lean production or lean manufacturing or lean, uh, lean can be applied everywhere, even for the transportation. And finally, this, this project is ongoing. We are uh, Canada Blood Services. They approach us and they, because of the experience that we are advertising reg regarding this research, they ask us to help them regarding to lean inventory management. They are paying billion dollars per year for inventory. So inventory for Canada Blood Services can be from day-to-day uh, -day material, also from medical supply gloves or uh, blood bags, so many things. But because of the sensitivity of the network that they have and the, the business that they have is not just, you know, selling or buying something, we are talking about sending blood from one location to another location. So there is zero tolerance here for any mistake because we are talking about life and death. So this project we just started and uh, we are communicating with them to develop a good uh, research project and research uh, application. And after that, we are submitting to NSERC National Research Canada for the fund. And we will assign a student to, uh, to do that. So there are different type of courses that a student that they can uh, use their knowledge in this research, but mainly is in operation management and specifically lean, one of the main players in this game. Six Sigma is another player. Business analysis is another player. At the same time, they use their knowledge from inventory management, supply chain management, customer uh, um, experience or uh, project management. Uh, and the last thing for, for me, I promise I, it won't take more than 30 seconds. We are also bridging to University of Ottawa Telford School of Management. We already did, and we are approaching a school of business, a Sprott School of Business as, at Carleton University. We are creating research group with including graduate students. Why? Because we believe that master and PhD student, they have in-depth knowledge and skills for research, and they can help Algonquin College students. So we, if we have four Algonquin College students and we assign one master or PhD student on that research, that is, those students all together, they can share or the knowledge, experience, and the skill, and it creates synergy. So recently we approached uh, Telford School of Management. We just submitted one application to NSERC and we are the, in the application we propose to, for the three years, we propose to hire 15 students, Algonquin College for that research. And the industry partners, uh, in, we have two industry partners. They, uh, support, they support this request to hire or a student as a co-op student. So they are working on research. They satisfy their, their co-op requirement. They have opportunity for, uh, for the future career path most of the time. And at the same time, Algonquin College has value, uh, knowledge contribution or value added technically, knowledge contribution in Canadian society. Uh, this is all for me. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamori. Um, it's very interesting, I think, uh, you know, when you see, you're talking about applied education, which of course Algonquin is, is known for, um, but then, uh, you know, the discussion that Isabel and, and Christopher brought forward, which is hands-on learning by doing, I think it's the same thing. I think the learning by doing piece is, is critically important. So thank you for that. I am going to um, hand this back over to Rod, and then after Rod, we're going to go to a Q&A session. Um, so I think as Phyllis sent a note to everybody, I said incorrectly, put your questions in the chat. I meant to say, put your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom and we've already got several. So uh, Rod, over to you, I think. There we go. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tamori and, and thank you, Isabel and Christopher. It was uh, really nice to get your feedback. And I'm really excited about uh, the thought leadership that Algonquin College has in terms of better equipping their students for the future. Um, you know, no one should be coming out of university or college now without a fundamental understanding of Lean and Six Sigma. It's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. And for those of you on the call today, all you have to do is go to your favorite job board and do a search on Lean Six Sigma. Now, Lean Six Sigma is often cited as a nice to have. 
And the reason is, is because all, virtually every organization in the world is doing some form of it. They, it. Whether they call it Lean Six Sigma or Avocado, it doesn't matter. These have become fundamental skill sets which will open the doors to younger professionals in terms of new opportunity. Uh, organizations value these skill sets. Um, that's why they're investing in upskilling their own team for that purpose. Um, so having said that, Algonquin College Corporate Training has, has put together a, a program of lean management. It's been around for several years. It continues to evolve and improve with the times. I'm really excited about this year's program. Um, I'd like to say that it's completely aligned with the industry expectation around what we call BELTS. It's a comprehensive program. It's aligned with industry, has universal apl applicability, and it follows and adheres to all of what one might consider to be the standards for lean, lean manufacturing or lean management. We have what we call BELTS, for those of you unfamiliar with, with lean and lean Six Sigma or Six Sigma. The belts are simply a level of recognition in terms of your understanding and experience in the body of knowledge. Introductory level white belt would be uh, applicable to anyone. It gives you the foundations of lean. It gets you to think about value. What are the principles of lean? And what are some of the basic tools that I can employ in my workspace or where I work? How can I participate in and promote this type of thinking in my organization? They have the yellow belts, which are more like localized facilitators. I, I, I always call them an orphan. Often we go from white belt to green belt, which is people that are equipped to do really large projects, whereas white yellow belts are a phenomenal resource, a small amount of investment and training, but those people can be the person Fridays working in, in departments, helping facilitate small rapid improvement events, uh, what we call 5S, which is workplace organization efficiency and safety. You don't need a green belt level of education to do that. Um, and then we have the green belts and what we call the ultimate, the, the black belts, the full body of knowledge. Um, we, we do offer a public course that starts on February the 9th. It takes you from white belt to black belt. It can be completed in about three months. Um, it, is, it includes both independent online study. Um, Dr. Tamori, I'll be sending him a link uh, as soon as this call is over to make sure he can have a look around and, and vet some of our online courses and perhaps even have the opportunity to share that with some of the regular Algonquin College students, a, a fabulous resource. Um, but we also blend that with live virtual training. So some of the key learnings from COVID-19, the, the notion of putting people into a classroom for three days in a row and force feeding them large amounts of information, hoping that they'll retain some of it, those days are gone. Uh, Bite-sized information, micro learning, COVID-19 has forced us to adapt in how we train and educate. It's, it's, of course, it's changed a lot of things. Um, but now we're serving up small bite-sized information and in breakthrough uh, 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 virtual classroom sessions of two to three hours in duration, where we, we give a small amount of information. But most of the information is learned independently online. The theory is no longer taught by Dr. Tamori or myself or Isabel or Chris. Students learn that independently. When they come into our classrooms, for, it's all about practical application. It's about taking what they've learned and applying it to case studies. And what a wonderful way to learn the tools. Uh, it's a little bit like driver's ed. You learn independently the rules of the road. When you, go, when you come into the classroom, you're getting behind the wheel and you're driving the car. Um, so uh, looking at the total investment from white belt to black belt, if you wanted to get your black belt, and you're coming in cold right at the very beginning. Uh, we can also assess you and parachute you in, depending on your previous experience, as to what level of entry should you have into the lean program. But if you're starting right at the beginning through to black belt, it represents about three months of effort and about 12 hours of investment per week. But out of those 12 hours, two, two, two of those would be uh, two virtual classrooms. So a little bit of independent online study, combined with virtual classroom practical application. Um, when we're dealing with corporate clients, of course, we tailor it. If we are working with Breer, they determine what the program should look like. We are simply a support function. We tailor it to their appetite for change, what they can afford to manage in terms of learning. But our program does focus on 
desired outcomes. You're investing in training. What are the desired outcomes in terms of behavioral change and actions that you're looking from for this particular investment that you're making? What are your strategic goals? And out of those strategic goals, how do we align as Dr. Tavori said and what Isabel and Chris suggested earlier, it has to be project centric. We wanna be able to apply what we're learning to meaningful projects. Uh, the program includes project management, change management, facilitation and coaching, all of the lean principle tools and methods that we've talked about earlier. But I, one of, we have differentiators. We've got a strong component of data analysis, which I, I'm gonna reach out to Dr. Tamori as soon as this call's over to talk about our data analysis component. It's not the Six Sigma type of analysis that Dr. Tamori referred to, but we, in organizations, you need to measure what matters and measurement drives behavior. So it would be wrong for us not to have a lean program that didn't have a very strong measurement data collection and analysis component. So I'm, we're really looking forward to working with students this year on the new program, uh, some of our corporate clients and, and tailoring it to their specific needs. And I'm, I can't say enough about the great work that Breer and the team are doing, but also uh, the great work that Dr. Tamori is doing in terms of giving the students these tools is going to enhance their opportunities as they go out into their professional careers of choice. And um, I'll give you one little story. I'm out golfing. We end up getting paired up with a, a young, a, a two young guys. Uh, this one gentleman named Evan, who's just getting out of university. Uh, of course, I can't not talk to him about Lean and Lean Six Sigma. I give him free access to all of our library of content, about 63 courses. Uh, he sat down at, uh, over a, about a two week period during Christmas and he completed all 63 Lean Six Sigma Black Belt program courses. And he's now working at the Department of National Defense as a, uh, a staff engineer. And yes, they are doing Lean Six Sigma at the Na Department of National Defense. So I'm hoping that he will share the experience with others. So, you know, the, it's an exciting time of change. And I think that Lean Six Sigma and, and lean proper can, can make a difference. It's not gonna be a panacea for all of the challenges ahead, but uh, it can be a, a, a phenomenal ally, both at a personal level, but also at a professional and organizational level. So thank you all for participating and sharing. And thank you everyone for being on the call, listening to us uh, share our experiences and our opinions. Wonderful, thank you, Rod. And Dr. Tamori, uh, get ready. It sounds like he's going to wanna keep you busy. Uh, not that you're yeah. not already a busy person. Yeah, um, I just I just have two, two very quick two things. Uh, first sure. of all, thank you very much, Rod. And I think I found the uh, Algonquin College found the fourth organization, which is Rod. We are going to help together for the research project. Definitely, I will approach you. I hope you you answer my call. And <laughs> I'm kidding. And I need also say thank you to Office of Applied Research and Innovation Entrepreneurship. Uh, in at Algonquin College. Christina's team, they did amazing job and we couldn't, you know, do this, all of this research without their support. I, I, and I, I need to admi admire that and thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tamori. And yes, that's all about the collaboration that we try to uh, instill and lean is about collaboration as well. Um, before we go to q and I did want to introduce, we have our president, Claude Brule, with us today. And uh, I think if he can turn his camera on, he's going to say a few words. Yeah, thank you very much, Catherine. This is a bit of impromptu. I joined the session. I, I was originally going to not be able to, and finally my schedule got freed up. So I'm delighted to be able to join this uh, wonderful session. Uh, pleasure to meet you, uh, Rod, Christopher, Elizabeth, and uh, Dr. Timori. Uh, wonderful to hear you speak. And, um, you know, I, I took some notes, so much I could say on the topic. I, I'm a true believer in uh, Lean and Six Sigma and uh, all those tools that uh, allow us to, to be on a journey. It's a journey, I have to remind people, not a destination, to instill a, um, a, a culture of continuous improvement, that, that's how I see it, that enhances the value to, to clients, whether it's experience, better experience, better satisfaction. Um, and it's so important, certainly in, in our sector, because you know we, like many of your sectors, we've had to adapt this to a non-manufacturing sector. We're in the service industry, so many of the concepts, often people don't relate to them exactly, so you have to translate this. 
And you have to demystify lean so that people don't see this as something that's going to take away jobs or, or take away employment. It's about engaging people. It's about empowering people, allowing them to be able within their sphere of influence to make changes that will actually benefit clients, benefit the organization overall. Um, I, I don't know if I coined this, but I, I have this little sentence that I use all the time. You know, perfection is the enemy of continuous improvement. And uh, to your point, I think, Isabel, that you've made, it's about practice, 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 right? You, you can train people, but you got to practice and make, make this a very applied in your setting. And what a great way to combine uh, your ability to do hands-on by learning it in your setting and making changes that will be uh, positive for everyone. You know, the PDSA cycle, right? Practice, you know, plan, do, study, act, or check, act. That's so important. Uh, so at Algonquin, we're uh, great practitioners of, of these tools and uh, delighted that uh, Catherine, you and your team were able to put together uh, not only uh, this session as part of our Future of Work series, but the great work that our corporate training is doing to create the, those PD opportunities, those programs that benefit employers and corporations. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Claude. I'm so glad you were able to join us. So we do have a few questions. And while I'm reading these out, um, if anyone else has any, please put them into the uh, Q&A button at the bottom. Um, and Rod and Dr. Tamori and Isabel, I'm going to kind of throw out the question and, and raise your hand, whoever wants to jump in first on it, because any one of you could, you could probably tackle aspects of these questions. So the first one is, what are the origins of lean and how has it evolved to apply to different industries? Go ahead, Rod. Uh, well, I think if you wanna look at lean concepts, tools and methods, we'd probably have to go back to the building of the pyramids or, or even before. Um, as, as mentioned earlier, is that the lean tools and methods are, are very much common sense when you look at them and they're evident all around us. If, you, if you're not familiar with them, you of course won't see them. You have to be aware of the tools and methods. But once you're aware of them, you'll see them being employed, not just around you, but also historically. Um, some might say that lean started out with, you know, post-World War II, the advent of the Toyota production system, the evolution of that, and to the point to today where we have the Toyota production system often referred to as the golden rule when it comes to lean management techniques. A lot of the tools and methods and principles um, have their origins in the Toyota production system. But you go to Honda, you'll see the Honda manufacturing system. It's the Toyota production system. They just don't want to call it that. And if you go to Boeing, the Boeing manufacturing system is the Toyota production system. But, but I do believe it, 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 there isn't one place where we could say this is where re lean really started. It has been an evolution. I think the, uh, the biggest breakthroughs for me have been the, the movement of lean out of manufacturing into the service sector in a big way. And um, healthcare. Uh, kudos to everyone working in that dynamic, incredibly challenging environment is, um, has been a big adopter of lean and adapting it in a way that it makes sense for them and persevering to actually uh, really pursue organizational effectiveness and efficiency using these tools and methods. There's nothing sadder to see the stress in the case of healthcare provision, the, the stress that's unnecessarily in the workplace. In healthcare, for example, it's a stressful environment. That's the, that's the nature of the beast. Um, but where you see additional stress because you have processes that are not designed effectively or capably to be able to serve the needs and relying on people to drive those vehicles, those vehicles that are not reliable for the road that they've been put on is, is probably the saddest thing. So I, I, say, I, I do digress from the original question. Um, so yeah, most people will think about uh, the lean as coming from the Toyota production system post-World War II, but go back a little bit further in history, Henry Ford and the moving assembly line, uh, the, um, the advent of the cotton gin, for instance, going back even further. But I'm sure as you go back in time, all the way to the building of the pyramids, you are going to see where innovative techniques have been used to make it easier to perform a function perhaps with less uh, re focus on human worth and human life, unfortunately, but uh, that just seems to be the reality. Perfect, thank you, Ron. Um, Isabel, you talked a little bit about 
some of the mistakes that were made. Can you elaborate uh, or what would you say would be some of the things that you would tell organizations who are considering implementing lean to watch out for? You or Christopher, whoever wants to handle that. Well, it, it's a very good question. And um, I would think that we've learned through the experience and offering the training um, for a number of years now. So we've learned uh, to uh, really make sure that we align everything, um, that it's a, it, it's a culture thing. It's quality improvement. And it not only starts with lean, but it's like lean is part of a much bigger plan to have a quality improvement culture in the organization. So lean is just like the one piece, one piece in the big puzzle. Uh, whenever we have new people coming on board at orientation, we spend time with them doing a quick game about quality improvement and speeding up the process of passing a ball and thinking that it's a patient. And we instill that from the get go. So I think that a mistake would be to have lean as a standalone, as a panacea, it's not the case. It, it's got to be part of a bigger plan and a culture of quality improvement. I'm going to turn it over to Chris, maybe as a different ideas of challenges or mistakes. <laughs> I think the challenges uh, mostly relate to sustaining. Um, you know, everyone's very uh, involved and engaged immediately after they've had training, but it's very easy to revert back to the status quo. Um, so it's, it's looking at how you provide um, everyone that you've worked with the opportunity to use the tools on an ongoing basis and to pull them into um, processes that are outside of the regular work day. Um, so really giving them some exposure and allowing them to uh, work with others in the organization uh, to really keep the tools fresh. Mm -hmm. um, maybe if I, can, if, if I can add one more thing. Um, when you say exposure, from my perspective in the learning development and the succession planning, those are great growth opportunities at, as well. So applying the skills that you just learned to a different sector in the organization, getting exposure. So there's so much more than just the pure theory behind it and the methodology. Um, so yeah, I would, I, I think that it did wonders for the organization and did change the mind, the mindset um, and provided the tools and the methodology really. Perfect, thank you so much, Isabel. We are just about on the hour. So uh, I will say that, you know, reach out to anyone in this group if you have questions. Everyone has kindly said, you know, uh, Isabel said she'd be happy to chat with anyone. Dr. Tamori, uh, I'm sure would respond to email if, uh, if anybody wanted to reach out to him for something specific. Um, just a reminder that this has been recorded and that you can find it at the futureworkseries.ca um, and look forward to additional questions, comments, or connections. Thank you all so much for being with us today. Thank you, Isabel, Christopher, Dr. Tamori, Rod. Um, yeah, and uh, happy lean management, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Be well, be safe, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.